Thank you very much, and thank you, Dennis, uh, for explaining so well the genomic theory, and I share with Scott uh, appreciation for helping us who don't understand it to uh, understand it a little bit better. And Scott, your baseball comments brought back some very bad memories of 20 years ago when we both coached Little League for 10 years and we'd show up at SBL and Scott would say, we went 15-0 and and won the state championship. How did your team do? <laughs> oh, and 15. <laughs> so I wish I hated this book, <laughs> but I don't. I love the book. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a few comments about it. First of all, let me begin by quoting Pope John Paul II. We've heard a lot about the two-book uh, analogy metaphor that the Westminster Confession of Faith and others talk about, and I'll talk about that in my afternoon session on how science can make us read the Bible better. But Pope John gets it in a much more pithy way when he says, science can purify our religion. Religion can purify science from idolatry. In my opinion, and my comments are going to be mostly addressed to uh, Scott since I'm a theologian myself. Scott rightly says Genesis, in Genesis 1 and 3, Adam and Eve are literary figures. And he's also right to say uh, that this literary figure, uh, the, uh, Adam, is what uh, Paul is referring to in Romans 5, 12 and following. You see, science does help us see the text better but I would also argue we don't really need science to help us read Genesis 1 through 3 better because it's so obviously figurative, as you were alluding to. I mean, you have days that with evenings and mornings without a sun, moon, and stars. I mean, that kind of knock you over the head. Or you have God described as creating Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathing on it. Uh, I think the rest of the Bible teaches God doesn't have lungs, okay? So, and we could go on and on, that what we have here is a description or a celebration of the fact that God has created a thing, everything, including human beings, but no interest in telling us how he did it. I would use the term theological history. John Walton and I had a discussion about theological narrative over against theological history uh, in preparation for our forthcoming book on the flood. Plug, we just finished it. The Lost World of the Flood will appear <laughs> in about, uh, and I'm going to talk about that in my afternoon session as well. But because we need to make a distinction, I think, between Genesis 1 to 11 and, say, the book of Job. Uh, the book of Job is good theological narrative, and I don't think it's historical in any sense, whereas in my opinion, Genesis 1 to 11 is a figurative depiction of things that actually happened. God did create the world. He did create human beings, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not interested in giving us the details of that. I also want to affirm uh, when Scott says, that the, uh, in his book, he says that the literary Adam is the front porch to the genealogical Adam. In other words, you often hear people citing the genealogies in order to say, see, Adam is a historical figure. And I would add this, that not only should we read Genesis 1 through 3 in its cognitive environment, stealing John's term there, but, uh, but we need to read the genealogies in their cognitive environment as well. And when we do, when we read the genealogies not like a modern American genealogy, but as an ancient Near Eastern genealogy, we realize, as one of my former professors put it in his definitive work on genealogy, quote, R.R. Wilson, quote, genealogies are not normally created for historical purpose. They're not intended to be historical records Rather, in the Bible, as well as in ancient Near Eastern literature and in the anthropological material, genealogies seem to have been created for domestic, political, and religious purposes, and historical information is preserved in the genealogies only incidentally. For more, you can see my article on genealogy in the New Dictionary of Christianity and Science. That said, does the literary Adam point to a historical Adam? And I'm 
thankful that Scott um, read his description of what he uh, considers to be the claim made when people are talking about the historical atom, those seven points that he made that you can find on pages 107 and 108. And I want to say I agree with him that if that's the historical atom, then there is no such historical atom. Uh, but I would suggest that that's not the only way to understand the historical atom. You see, figurative language points to something beyond itself. Metaphors signify. I would take the literary Adam and Eve not as a reference to a specific couple that were the sole progenitors of all of us, but rather as a reference to a population, perhaps at the origins of humanity, or perhaps, if I understand Dennis Alexander and Tom Wright correctly, uh, at the point, perhaps in the Neolithic period, when humans begin to show religious sensibilities. Now, it's not necessary, in my opinion, to pinpoint an answer to that question, but at some point, God endows uh, a group with the status of being image bearers. Now, critics of the position that Scott, Dennis, and I take might make an accusation of deism. We talked about that a little bit um, last night or yesterday afternoon. In other words, they say, how can you tell that God did it if you can't point to some sign, perhaps irreducible complexity that shows God's involvement? Well, to me, that's where the second half of Pope John Paul II's comment becomes relevant when he says, religion can purify science from idolatry. We know it, we know God did it, not because of some irreducible complexity, but because the Bible tells us he did it. <laughs> That's the purpose of the Bible. You know, I, I believe in order to understand, not I understand in order to believe. Let me add this question. Is God any less present in his providential orderings? As an Old Testament professor, I urge you to read the books of Ruth and Esther, okay? Everything that happens in there can be explained by secondary causes, and in the book of Esther, God's not even mentioned once by name, but can you read those books and not see God's guiding hand? In sum, Scott and Dennis are right that Adam and Eve are literary figures. Scott is right to deny historical Adam in the way that he defines it on pages 107 and 108. In my opinion, and not sure how Scott and Dennis would react to this, but I'm sure I'll find out, the literary Adam and Eve point either to an original human population as a whole or a representative couple who, at the time of their endowment with the status as image bearers and their commission to be, uh, to rule and subdue the world, that at that moment they were morally innocent, innocent. And the point of the story in Genesis 1 through 3 is to tell us that the reason why there is sin and evil and death in the world is not because God made us that way, but because of human rebellion. Now, Scott is also correct to deny what I would call the inheritance model of original sin. But there are also other models, and I think Lauren's going to be talking about some of those in the next session. My own view at the moment is influenced by John Walton's very interesting article in the journal Zygon, where he talks about how the story of Adam and Eve tells us how we would all act in that situation. Plus, that act so disrupts social and cosmic fabric that it's impossible for us not to sin. So, um, so those are some thoughts. Maybe I'll conclude with just one final comment, and this uh, gets to the genre of Genesis 1 to 11, where I think we have theological history where actual events are being described in a figurative manner in order to make a theological point. And draw an analogy with, say, the apocalyptic portions of the New Testament, particularly the book of Revelation. Uh, 
as we read the book of Revelation, we're reading about things that we believe are actually going to happen. You know, Jesus is going to come back again. But do we read it as a description of how exactly it's going to happen? Is he really going to come back riding a storm cloud? It is a storm cloud, by the way, not a white fluffy cloud. This is storm god imagery from the Old Testament. Is he really going to come back riding a storm cloud? Uh, well, then that would conflict with the picture we get in Revelation 19.11 and following when he's riding a white horse. Uh, so, in other words, in both the Urzite, you know, the deep, deep past, and the Enzite, the far distant future, we have depictions of actual events. God did create us, uh, but using figurative language. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dennis. And I will join the chorus and say everybody should run out and buy this book and read it. It's excellent. <laughs>